I mean, I, I need to have written this book because I am a teacher, I am a practitioner, and I am a playwright. I'm all those things. But something in the last five years is telling me that a basic notion at a very, very uh, formative, primordial level of recording, you know, of leaving a record of what a particular kind of mode has been doing. And when you leave a record, you also theorize on the politics of that record. So it has been on my mind for a while, I must say. But the actual writing and for all the ills that are attributed to it, including the suppression by, uh, you know, uh, by your own government of, of, of so many liberties, I really owe it in the sense to the pandemic. You know, I was, uh, just before it, just before the, you know, it sort of, uh, it hit the ceiling, right? I was busy making points. What do I want to work on? What do I want to write on? And then came this prolonged phase. And I, I really sat down and worked in that phase. You know, collated some of my older material, reworked that, you know, I wrote about, about two thirds of the book is a fresh writing. I looked at, I mean, I have about 40, 50 scripts that I put down in these years. And they're all active scripts. In the sense, I never publish a script. You know, and it's, it's also flexible, malleable in terms of languages. So when we're performing in the street, it's a different mode. When we're doing it in a community, it's a different mode. And when we're doing it in a proscenium, it's a different mode. You know, the mo modes change. And from there, move into what has been possibly the most prized and the most uh, definitive aspect of the theatre, the way I've practiced it with my group, Bandy's Theatre, right? To which I owe my, well, not just theatre, but my own, my very existence, right? You know, the idea of what we call community workshop theatre, where we either interact or preferably go and live with the community and make them create theatre with their stories. So this has been my, my journey of the last, uh, shall I say, two and a half, okay, maybe three years, but now it's been almost six months since the book was published. So, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been a very interesting writing for me, right? At times painful, but more often very rewarding, very fulfilling. I, I mean, I, I, I see it as a task that as, an, as a performance activist, needed to be done. Whether I do a follow-up or not will depend on how circumstances fall out in the future. But it's definitely something that needed to be done. The statement needed to be made. I, I, I do feel that, you know, theatre has the kind of political teeth which cinema cannot have. Because cinema means that much more money required. And when you have a couple of crores swinging, you know, and you have a protest in some remote part of the country, you have to change your names, you have to change your dress, you have to change whatever you have to change. And in any case, politically, you move within a particular corridor. Not to say cinema has not been political, there have been some very, very good work, but you know, it's, it's within a corridor that you have to work. Whereas the teeth of theatre are very sharp. Okay, and I, I really feel that as times get worse, activist theatre gets sharper. A, a lot of us don't work, cannot work, but wherever there is work, wherever there is potential, it's extremely sharp. What theatre tends to lack in, right, is the numbers. You know, that's always been a problem. How many people watch? Okay. Now, Pandis did a couple of experiments in cyber theatre, right? We put up, uh, right in the beginning of the pandemic, we put up Oday's Still the Day I Die, which is supposed to be the first chronicled American, yes, but anti-fascist play. On the one hand, taking on Hitler's Germany, and on the other hand, taking on McCarthy's US. So it's, 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 it's really a fabulous play. And would you believe it? We got 7,000 right? We put it free on Facebook. We put it on Zoom. We just, just let it out. And of, co of course, there was all the, you know, people were not getting any entertainment. People were not seeing things. Right? Okay. I think anybody who had seen anything of Bandy's ever, plus maybe people who had never seen us, I think it, it was really became, I mean, two shows, 13,000 people. You know? So, I do feel that there is that potential which we need to work on, whether it means hybridization, whether it means opening it beyond the auditorium, because the whole problem is that even in an auditorium, how many people do you get at a time? So there is that problem, right? Uh, the strength is, activist theater in particular, has a certain insularity towards capitalism. I mean, to put it very simply, 
if I just have something to say and I want to perform, I don't, I mean, if I have the nerve for it, if I have the energy for it, if I have the guts for it, I don't need much money. And that's something which has always surprised me. You know, five people getting together, putting their hands in their pocket, can, can do one hell of a lot. I mean, even when you do a, do a street performance, and particularly if you're known in that area, I mean, suddenly you find there are eight, nine hundred people sitting around you as you started, you know. Of course, there'll be children crying, there'll be trucks coming. But then, what is it that you want? Do you want that bourgeois pin drop silence, which my favorite Brecht himself was very, very opposed to? Right? He didn't quite like it. Okay? So, uh, it's really a question of what is it that you are looking for, looking at, you know, which, which, which comes in, which comes in in this mode. The second zone is bourgeois theater, right? Which I don't actually regard as theatre. Because I think, see, I, I feel cinema is an important space to perform. Because that's where you have people with power. And particularly, the kind of theatre that I have, you know, I have done, you have young people. It's the empowered youth. Who is going to become more empowered, who are going to be your policy makers and your change makers of the future. And I always feel, you know, as a teacher, that if you leave that seed in a young mind, it remains there. It remains there like nothing else in the world can. So, proscenium theatre has a kind of challenge and a kind of importance. And, you know, over the years we've learned how to do it. You know, we become good with it. Right? Because you have to put in certain things that are going to interest. Like, if I want to talk about contemporary politics, I'll put it via a, a Shakespearean classic. Okay? I know my young audience is going to come and listen. Whether it's Kursi, Kursi Vishal, Bhardwaj's films or any other reason. Okay, right. I mean, if, if, if I say, if I, if I put up a version of Macbeth or a version of anything for that matter, you know, which is reasonably in the common imagination, I will get Swachta Abhiyan, right? It goes on the streets. But it's not street theatre. It's not at all street theatre. It's an endorsement. It's a supportive exercise, which in my terminology does not qualify as theatre at all. And in fact, when you come to Iyan, which is as powerful as street theatre, you know, I tell a lot of people who say, Kya, ye mil gaya, we've gotten this, we've gotten that, we can do this. I say, please do not pervert this form, which is possibly the most powerful form of theatre in the world. You know, right? So these are the two things that I have in mind. Okay. The third, something which I just said earlier. I mean, if you have the time and you have the resource, a very good way of getting marginalized voices in into the mainstream is not by creating a UCC and, you know, trying to say that everything is now straight. No. Get those voices in. Be a Paulo Fryer and say that if I have a position of power, okay, I'm possibly not qualified, you know, to make policy for those who are not in positions of power. Get those voices in. Let those voices interact. Let those voices strike. And, you know, one of my greatest experiences, which I, I really see as a paradigm for people uh, looking forward, okay, was a play that we presented in Delhi, right? And we took to New York. The only play that, I mean, only two plays of Pandit have gone abroad, right? And this was the second one way back in 2012. Because that kind, that demands a kind of resource which even a group like ours finds very, very difficult to find. And we need a lot of support from outside to be able to do that. So, this was a play which was based on short skits that we had created with platform show. See, it's a, uh, it's directed at a variegated uh, audience. I'm looking at my work over about four decades and uh, international collaborations, Indian collaborations, working with people across and speaking as a performer, as a teacher and as a playwright. It's a research scholar, teacher's reference and it's got something important for the playwright, for the budding playwright in particular. Because two scripts, one of which was in Hindi and the other in Punjabi, I have specifically translated into English for this work and sort of explained the dynamics of, of how script writing works. So it's, it's really getting together three very, very integral zones, right? Uh, and four decades of experience in each of them. So uh, that's where we're coming from. It tries to posit it tries to posit what is so special about the Jan Rikol theatre. You know, why? 
I mean, at the very basic, is the difference between theater and other creative arts. And I especially mind fiction and poetry, particularly fiction, to which it is in many ways very, very close. Now, unlike fiction, or for that matter, a poem, a play is a set of people coming together, wanting to say something, right? And finding another set of people who's willing to listen. So right in the beginning, we have two things overstressed, the politics and the communication. I mean, uh, when a novelist writes, he writes with himself. The creation of a play is quintessentially a collaborative act. And unlike a play text, a piece of fiction is complete in itself. You have a beginning, you have a middle, you have an end. Now, the way you look at a short story and the way I look at it may be very, very different. That's another zone. But you see, a play script is invitational. I always compare it uh, uh, to a marriage card. Because uh, when somebody invites you to a marriage, they're not asking you to come and attend. They're asking you to come and complete. Give your blessings. It's a completion process. It's an invitation to complete what has been started. A play text is always that invitation. It lies there begging, begging a unit to pick it up and work on it. The meaning of a play is unstable in a sense, you know, which is actually very, very difficult to fathom. The same play you can look at from one perspective and from another perspective without actually changing the text. You know, like for instance, when we did uh, uh, Genet's Balcony the first time, we did one setting in France, Paris. The other setting was Delhi's GB Road. The, the dialogue, the lines remained exactly the same. We changed the other dynamics, the music, the songs, you know, the background. And the two plays were going in very, very different directions. One was head. One was making the kind of points which the playwright was possibly making in his time. But the second one was a very, very subversive play about what is happening in our own society in terms of patriarchy, in terms of capitalism. The whole notion of objectifying, the whole notion of the commodification, the gross commodification that occurs, particularly in a, in a space like a public brothel, you know, which is not even the same as another kind of sex work. So it's very political, it's very incomplete. Okay? That brings me to my, my second point, my basic thesis, right? It's, it's quintessentially a naysaying act. I, I'm not saying endorsement theater is not possible. I'll come to endorsement theater in a bit. But quintessentially, it's a naysaying act. Why is it naysaying? Because I want to speak if I'm not okay with things. And you know, you know, it's very interesting because there's always been this very, very close relationship between authority, call it state, in the case of college theater, for instance, call it the college principals, the college authorities. There's always that relationship. See, those in authority sense the power of theater, they believe. So, authority right? The world, the way it's constructed, is geared to take our rights away from us, right? Theatre may not get us those rights, okay? But it's definitely a statement of the rights being taken away. It's an extremely in-your-face yard. And the two words that in our own polity have become so uh, obnoxious today, resistance and dissent, theatre is really centrally about that. Thank you.